All right, today we're going to look at more intense photo editing. Uh, and my focus today is going to be using the GIMP. Um, pretty much anything we do here you could also do in Photoshop if that is your poison, as they say. But um, I'm a big free fan. I'm a big open source fan. So I definitely probably um, use the GIMP more than I use Photoshop. So I'll probably focus on that. Um, we'll kind of touch base to... Um, cover some of the basic edits that almost any photo editing software would provide. And then we'll go in to do some of the more heavy stuff. Now, again, some of these things may be implemented a little bit differently in Photoshop, but the idea is, is the same. Um, the other thing that is similar that we'll notice is that um, a bit about the file formats that we're going to talk about. All right. Insofar as there are typically some proprietary formats that you use when you're editing or creating your material, and then there's sort of public formats that are used when you want to just get it to the rest of the world. All right. And we'll see what each of those are for the GIMP and so on. All right. I'm going to start out by bringing up an image in the GIMP. I hope, as the GIMP is loading. And we'll first start off by talking about some of the basic kinds of edits that can be performed. Keep in mind, why do we edit images? We edit images, number one, to change the format of them. You know, So if we want to save it as a different file format, a PNG, or a JPEG, or a GIF, or whatever, we can, we can edit an image that way to do that. We can do that uh, to change the dimensions of the image if we need a smaller version of the image. The one thing that we spoke of before is it is important to it is important to um, base your edits off of the original and in fact if you go in and at a later time you want to go back and revise your edits Again, don't base it off the edited version, but go back to the original. Again, that's, uh, some of the compressions are lossy compressions, which means you can actually lose some data. So if you edit off of something that you've already edited, you can lose even more data and, and diminish the quality even further. So it's best to base things off of the original. <laughs> All the images today, by the way, um, are, are my own copyright. So I, I did that so I don't have to display any copyright notices today. All right, so let's look at the first one that we're going to do and we're going to play around with. Something that a friend of mine thought was so hilarious to do to my car during the winter. So original and hilarious. And that is to right wash me on the back windshield. All right. Now, what are some of the basic fixes that we talked about doing as far as saving it as another format? I can go in under File, Save As. And with the GIMP, you simply specify the file extension that you want to save it as, and then click Save, and it will save it as that extension. Resize the image. You go to... Um, scale image, and you can express the si new size in pixels or in percentages or in inches or, or so on. It's generally good to keep that linked together because when you resize it, you want to resize it in both dimensions. and You want to resize it equally in both dimensions, otherwise you will stretch it one way or another. X and Y resolution, as far as the density of the pixels, that is most relevant when it comes to printing. When, it, when you're talking about screen, that really doesn't come into play because you're tied to the monitor's dimensions. Is the default usually 72? I believe so, yeah. But again, it's kind of largely a moot point because you're tied to the screen's um, resolution. 
other, a lot of the other basic fixes come in on the colors where we can go in and we can affect the brightness or the contrast. That's often done with an image. Again, if the lighting isn't optimal, you can either make the picture brighter or darker or you can adjust the contrast. The contrast is the difference between the brightest brights and the darkest darks on the image. So if we make a higher contrast, I can't get it right back at zero. All right, if we make a higher contrast, you'll notice that, that the white areas become real white and the dark areas become real black. If we do this, it's kind of very washed out. Oftentimes, if you want to use something as a background image for a web page, for example, um, you don't necessarily want a full, uh, full force, regular, nice looking image. You might want it to look more like a watermark, right? Where you just sort of faintly see the image in the background. In which case, if you sort of wash it out by setting a very low contrast, you might just be able to see the, the, the background image and the text over top of it will appear readable. Whereas if it's something, whoops, with a higher contrast, The dark print against the dark background would be hard to read, or light print against the light background would be hard to read. So you can sort of, by making the contrast very low and making the brightness very high, you can sort of achieve sort of a watermark effect. All right? Those are the basic ones we talked about last time, all right, that you should be able to do, you know. We're going to look get into now into maybe a little bit more um, involved fixes. For example, let's take the smiley face. Let's say I want to get rid of the smiley face from here. This is no laughing matter, right? I mean, someone vandalizing my car with these vicious messages, all right? How can you do it? There's a couple ways you could do it. And Photoshop, again, has something similar. This is called the healing tool. It looks like a little Band-Aid. And what you can do is you can go, if you click on it to select it, you can go, and I can click control click for the pattern that I want to duplicate somewhere else. So, for example, I'm going to dim the lights just a little bit, maybe make it a little bit easier to see. control click to say, you know, this is the area that I sort of want to clone down here. So I make my control click, and now when I paint over top of it, effectively it's replacing, and it might be very hard to see, but it's replacing what you have there with the pattern from up here. Now, again, I'm just sort of doing this quickly, but again, control click, clicks what we're going to clone, and then we can drag it over to paint with that, to go and heal that. And if you take enough time to do it, you can get a reasonably good looking uh, fix for that. All right. um, again, I'm kind of doing this rushed, so it doesn't really look perfect, but you can see with a little bit of time, we can go in and we can get it to look however um, it wants. We definitely got rid of the smiley face, and while it's not perfect, uh, again, um, with a little bit more time and care, we could make it look a lot better. One thing that's often done when you're doing these kind of repairs is you go into view and make the view very, very large. So for example, maybe not quite that large in this case, but you can make it maybe 200% size. 
size. And that can sort of help you with these fixes. All right, there we see this area here doesn't look so good. This area where the nose and eyes were doesn't look bad, but we could go in and fix this a little bit to make it look better still. And you can see as we're going and clicking our mouse, it's showing us, it's very tough to tell, but it's showing us where it's copying the pixels from. That's one thing that we can do, all right, to fix that. All right, so that would be if we wanted to eliminate something, you know. If you wanted to eliminate, you know, a, a blemish on someone or a scar, you know, on someone, you could do that. Um, the estimates of how photoshopped images are in magazines is crazy, uh, if you've ever seen that, you know, the, the difference between the original and that. So they do all sorts of things as far as manipulation of images, especially like in fashion magazines. And again, that's one way that you could, you could fix, say, a blemish or something like that. Um, here's another one that we're going to do. I'm going to do a little bit different, and I'm going to use a slightly different technique or maybe a combination of techniques. Here we have a train that someone defaced with a little smiley face. Well, let's say if I was the owner of this railroad company and I wanted to use this on, you know, on our website, but I didn't like the fact that someone vandalized it and I wanted to get rid of it. What could I do? Well, one thing that you could do is you could use a similar technique that we just used and use that uh, healing to go in and pick something up here and then go over that to do that. That's one thing that you could do. I might not take this approach in this case though. I'm going to go and click undo a few times. What I might do would be something like this. I might use my rectangle select to select a section of this about as big and copy it and then paste it and then I can move that into place and cover that up. All right. And finally I could say that I want to anchor that. All right. And actually that doesn't look bad. All right, you know, for a small resolution, that might not be that bad of an approach. Sometimes when you do it, it's a little more apparent. All right, yeah, go ahead. In, in GIMP, how do you keep, how do you prevent GIMP from automatically merging layers like that? In Photoshop, if, if I did an edit like that, right, that would be layer number two. We'll, we'll, we'll go over that. Okay. We'll go over layers in a, in, a, in a few minutes here. All right. Now, if I go and do a, a really exaggerated view of this, if I look very closely, I can see that edge there where I pasted it. All right? might not be apparent at the regular resolution, but if I were to go and make a, a, a higher resolution, or if I were to look very closely, I could see that it was doctored to do that. Well, one thing that you could do is there's a tool that I really like to use that is a smear tool or a, blur, a smudge tool, all right? And I can go, and you can set the size of it. This is a scale of one. And again, you can set some parameters about how intense it's going to be and all that. And if I just go up that edge a little bit, that smooths it out. And just a little bit, I could get rid of that where it would be even harder to tell. All right. You could also do that in the first case uh, to uh, wh where I was getting rid of the smiley face. I could use a blur to blur some things out on that too. But the smudge tool is very effective in like uh, covering up where you paste one thing into another. Like if I do uh, manipulations where I have different layers and I put myself, let's say, in a background of, a, of an image, very often what I'll do is I will run the blur tool around the edge of the one image to sort of smooth that out so it's less apparent that uh, it's there. All right. There are a couple other things. There's a dodge and burn tool where we can make things lighter or darker. Um, 
If we want to burn, we could then go over top on this and notice that as we go over, that gets slightly darker. We do it again, it gets slightly darker still. What that's effective for is if you're taking a, a picture of someone and there's like an extreme shadow and maybe you want to uh, make the, the shadow a little softer. Let's bring up uh, a picture here. You know, maybe I want to, I don't know, lighten this a little bit. I could go in and dodge that and I could lighten a section of my skin if I wanted to if it was the lighting wasn't particularly good alright it's not particularly effective in this case that wasn't a good example but again dodge and burn allows you to, to dodge and dodge which means lighten or burn which means uh, to, to make darker the degree to which that Lightens and darkens can be controlled. Right, right. right. Like here is, here I, I really push the amount very high. So when I do that, it lightens it. I can make it less. Or it lightens it. You can also set the opacity. You can also set the shape of the brush. You know, a lot of flexibility as far as that goes. Repeat that, please. It looks like down at the wave bottom. Right, right, yeah. It's kind of hard because the toolbar's in the way. As far as exposure and highlights and shadows or, or just mid-tones that you want to do. Oh, the scale is the scale of the brush. My mistake. And the amount of jitter is if it goes in a straight line or it moves. All right, there I'm getting maybe more into something a little more realistic. with a smaller brush. Do keep in mind that my purpose here is not to create masterpieces. All right? I want to give you a sense of what these tools are so that you can go and you can experiment. You know, after class we have a lab. You know, a lab's a place where experiments happen. So you're not going to learn how to do this by watching me do this. You're going to learn how to do this by getting your hands dirty and going in and uh, uh, creating that. So, one thing we had a question on was layers, all right? How do I achieve layers? I'm going to go, and I'm going to try to do this. This is going to be my, or, uh, well, we can do this a couple different ways. I'm going to start out with this picture. I'm going to try to make it so that the closer apple stays red, but the apple in the background is in black and white, is in grayscale. And we're going to talk about how to do that. Now, this could be done a couple different ways. I'm going to show you the way that I like to do it. All right? And I like to do this with layers. All right? What are layers? We're going to see layers in just about every other multimedia. It's where you can kind of lay things on top of each other. So think if I was drawing, you know, the, the, the old school projectors with the transparencies where you could draw on it. If you draw two things on those transparencies and put them on top of each other, you see both those things. All right? So the background that we're drawing on becomes transparent. All right? Let me explain to you briefly how I'm going to make the back apple black and white while keeping that red. I'm going to go and I am going to duplicate this image on a second layer. All right? So right now, this is a single layer. In fact, we can go and look at, there's a window oops, that shows us that there's one layer, the background. Remember, JPEGs only have one layer to them. All right? JPEGs don't have multiple layers like, like GIFs can. All right. So when we bring that in, that's what we see. Now, what I can do is I can go in and I can duplicate this layer. 
So I'm going to have two pictures of apples sitting on top of each other. All right. What am I going to do then? Well, I'm going to go and I'm going to set the transparency of the layers so that if there's nothing there, that is if I erase from this, I'm going to get transparency, which means what? That you can see the layer underneath it. All right. Normally with a JPEG, if I go in here and I erase, let's go and let me pick my eraser. I'll make it big. If I go here and erase, what does it show me? It shows me that color, or it shows me white. All right. Well, that's not what I want. I want this to go away completely so that there's nothing there, not a big blob of white. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go on my layer under transparency and say add an alpha channel. An alpha channel is for transparency. So now I go and do that. Now the picture doesn't look any different except when I go to erase. Because when I go to erase, notice how we get that little checkerboard thing going on there. That means that that's transparent. Which means that if there was a layer underneath this, that would be the layer that would poke through. All right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in and I'm going to duplicate the layer. No, I'm not going to do that. Duplicate layer. I was under image, not layer. I'm going to duplicate the layer. Now notice in our little layer thing, we have two layers. There's two copies of that picture. All right? I can show or hide either of them. There's both of them hidden. First one shown, second one shown. If I show any of them, it looks the same because the layers are duplicates of each other. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go on the background image. All right, I'm going to go on the background, the, the, the underneath layer. And again, I know this is the underneath layer because it appears underneath it in the list. I'm going to make the top layer invisible. So I'm clicking the top layer off, and I'm editing now the bottom layer. So what I can do under here, under Color Tools, Hue Saturation, I can go and turn the saturation off, turn the power of the color off. So I've now created a black and white image, but only on the bottom layer. That first layer I haven't edited. So I can go click OK, and now... The bottom layer is black and white because I'm not showing the top layer, right? I, turned the, I made the top layer invisible. If I make the, the, the top layer visible again, I see the color image, okay? Well, how then could I go and let the bottom peek through, all right, to show the black and white of that apple? Well, that's where I go in and I start erasing. All right. Now we're going to look at a couple different ways that we can get rid of that red apple, that, that second red apple. But the first sim simple way is to erase. So I'll go and I'll create my eraser tool. And usually if I'm doing this, this is what I'll do. I'll go in and make the eraser as big as I can and erase like... big chunks of it. Making sure, of course, I'm editing the right layer, because now I want to edit the top layer and erase away the red on the top layer. So I'm going to go and erase that, and you notice as I erase the top layer, what shows through, because I've set transparency as a bottom layer, so I see it in black and white. Now, how I want to go from there, well, that varies. I have a couple of options. I could continue with the eraser. I could make the eraser smaller to get sort of a finer point on things and erase away, which kind of gets a little tedious at times. All right. Typically when I'm doing this, this is where I would go and make it a lot bigger than it actually is. So I can go and see exactly what I'm erasing. Oh, I didn't want to do that. Maybe erase this 
this over here. All right. So that's one thing I can do is just sort of fine tune the eraser, make the image bigger, make the eraser smaller. Another thing I can do is I can use select by color. And I can click on that. The problem with select by color is it will select everything in the image of that color. All right. Actually, let me try this. Let me go back to select none. I'm going to go and select a rectangle. And then inside the rectangle, I'm going to say select by color. That still gives me both of them. All right. Let's see if I control click on here. Will that work? Yeah. Well, kind of. Yeah, it goes, shows me what I'm selecting, so I'm going to select part of that apple too. So that might not work. The other thing that works, uh, that can work, is the magic wand. The magic wand allows you to sort of pick contiguous areas here. And if you hold control down, or shift down rather, it adds to it. So I could go in and without picking that, I could pick these things pretty carefully and then go up here and say edit clear. Again, it pays off some a lot of times when you're doing this to go into a, you know, a, 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 a much more magnified view. So in general, this is how I can layer two images on top of each other. I can go in and I can make, um, I can make um, an image, set transparency for that image, and then I can sort of clear away parts of the image to, make, to let the, the under image show through. All right. So now we're pretty close to being there, all right? And again, what did I use? I used a combination of the eraser at different sizes, different zooms in. Select by color, I tried. It wasn't particularly effective in this case. And the magic wand. Uh, and there's a magic wand sort of thing in Photoshop as well, all right? Let's go a couple more iterations of the magic wand. And we'll say that we're done. Now, here's a case where I might actually go, uh, depending on how it looks, if we can go and we can magnify this. Actually, the border between the two apples looks pretty good. But if I didn't like the way that border worked, I might smudge it to kind of... to kind of uh, make a less abrupt transition between the two different layers. Would zooming in like that be kind of uh, what people say images are fake? Is that like how they tell? Yeah. Like, for example, if you looked at something and said, oh, I, you know, gee, that picture of Mike standing next to Franklin Roosevelt is fake, what would you do? Well, you probably would go in very big, and look, and you'd probably see, and sometimes they call these artifacts, like little leftover things. Like maybe you could see a border of, of between the, the textures of the two or whatever. So, yeah. And, you know, there's other ways, too. For example, like if you looked real closely, like let's say, again, the hypothetical picture of me and Roosevelt, the shadows might be 